Hi there, I'm Eric Siegel with ericstrains.com and welcome to part two of my Atlas O-Scale track and signal tutorial. In part one of this series, we took a look at the Atlas O-Scale 21st century track system. And in that video, we covered the installation and the setup of the track and the switches and so forth. So if you haven't watched part one yet, go ahead and watch it before you watch part two so that you're up to speed in terms of the test track that we set up in that video and that we're gonna use today. Now in part two, we're gonna cover the Atlas 21st century signal system. And that will allow you to integrate realistic signals into your O-Scale layout. When it comes to integrating signals into an O-scale layout, for me, there are really two sides to it. One side is what I call the technical side, and the other side is what I call the application side. The technical side covers the actual installation of the signals themselves. How do you install them? How do you configure them? And how do you get them working on your layout? And then the application side addresses more of the prototypical issues. What specific types of signals should you use? Where should you put those signals? And other questions like that. Now, the application side of things can get pretty complicated sometimes, especially if you're trying to get ultra prototypical signal functionality on your layout. And the main reason for that is because the types of signals that you use and the way that you use those signals on your layout can vary a whole lot depending on the era that you're modeling and the specific railroad that you're modeling. And so for that reason, in this video, I'm really not gonna worry so much about the application side of things. I'm gonna try to stick to the technical side. So what I want to do today is to show you how to hook up the Atlas signal system and how to use it on your layout. And of course, along the way, we will touch on some prototypical issues and we will talk about balancing prototypical with practical on a model railroad. But overall, we're going to stick to the technical side of things today. And then after that, it's up to you to do the necessary research to figure out the specific types of signals and so forth that you should be using on your layout. Anyway, we've got a lot of material to cover today, so let's go back to the workbench and get started. Okay, we're back at the workbench, and here's the demo board that we set up in part one. We set up our test track, our switch controllers, and our power supplies. And remember, all of this was set up in part one, so make sure that you've watched part one, because going forward, I'm just going to assume you've already watched part one, and I'm not going to re-explain what we've already set up here. So we're just about ready to tackle our track signals, but before we do, I want to take a look at our power supplies over here because there's one adjustment that I want to make right now that's going to help us later down the road when we start setting up the track signals. Here are the two power supplies for our test track, and if you recall from part one, the Lionel CW80 is powering just the track, and the MTH Z1000 and its corresponding terminal block over here are powering everything else, the switches, the switch controllers, and it'll also power these signals that we install today. Now again, you don't have to do it like this. If you want to use just one power supply to power everything, you can do that, but I prefer to separate it out. I like for there to be a dedicated power supply for just the trains on the track, and then a separate power supply or power supplies for everything else. So that's the way we're going to do it today. Now, the change we're going to make in the setup over here is needed because we're using separate power supplies. We need to connect ground on the Z1000 to ground on the CW80. The reason is because the signals that we're going to install today are going to be triggered by what are called insulated track sections. And insulated track sections are triggered by the ground on the transformer. And so, because we have separate power supplies, we need ground on the CW80 to equal ground on the MTH Z1000 and vice versa. So what we're going to do is connect ground here to ground here, or in layman's terms, black to black. Okay, I've got a piece of wire right here, and what I'm going to do is connect this ground to this ground. I've got both power supplies turned on so that if there's a problem when I connect them together, I will know about it. There shouldn't be, but just in case there is, I've got them both powered on. So I'll take this side of the wire and wrap it around the ground post on this terminal block that's connected to the Z1000. And then I'll take the other side and connect it to the ground post on the CW80. And we're done. That's all there is to it. Now let's go ahead and hook up some track signals. These are the Atlas track signals that we're going to be using today. Now Atlas makes more signals than what you see here, but these are the three types we're going to use today. This is the Atlas Type G signal back here. This is the four pack, but you can also buy them one by one. The four pack is just a little more economical. In front of that, we've got the Type SA searchlight signal. And then in front of that, we've got a switch signal. The switch signal is going to be the first thing that we hook up today because it's the easiest to hook up. So if you're new to signaling, this will be a good thing to help you get your feet wet. 
So let's go ahead and start setting up some switch signals. Now, what is a switch signal? A switch signal is quite simply a signal that indicates how a switch is thrown. Here's our switch. Here's the main line on our test track. Here's a siding. And what we want to have is a couple signals up here so that a train that's approaching on the main line or the siding will be able to tell how this switch is thrown. So we're actually going to install two of these today. One will be installed about right here on the main line, and then the second one will be installed about right here on the siding. Both of those signals will be connected to this switch, and then that way, when we throw the switch, it'll change the aspect on each one of those signals, and the approaching train will be able to tell how the switch is thrown. When you first open the switch signal box, this is what you're going to find. A set of instructions, then you've got the switch signal itself with the corresponding cable. You've got the control board that's going to make the whole thing work. Right here we've got some mounting brackets for the control board. And then over here we've got another cable that's going to go from the control board to the actual switch. Now even though I'm going to show you how to hook up one of these switch signals today, when you get one of these things, do yourself a big favor and read the instructions that come with it. They're just one page long, they're very easy to understand, and reading them ahead of time will help you avoid a lot of problems down the road. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to do is mount the control board. Here's the control board, and you'll notice that there are four holes in the control board. One, two, three, and four. Those holes are for the optional mounting brackets. Here's one of the mounting brackets, and to attach it, you just snap it on like that. And then here's the second one over here and we'll attach that the same way. And there we go. And with these mounting brackets attached, you now have any number of different ways to mount this board underneath your layout. Now, ordinarily you would mount these boards under the table and out of sight, but for today's demonstration, I'm gonna be mounting these boards on top of the table so that you can more easily see what's going on. I've got the board in position, so now I'm just gonna fasten it down using the mounting brackets and some screws. These are drywall screws, but you can use any kind of screw you want. Okay, the control board is in place. The last thing I'm gonna do before we move on is drill a few holes in order to bring wires up to the control board. Now, ordinarily, if you were gonna mount this board under the layout, you wouldn't have to drill any holes next to the board because the wires would already be under the layout with the board. But because I've got the board mounted up on top here, I've gotta drill a few holes to bring those wires up. Okay, I've got my holes drilled and the board is looking good, so now we're going to turn our attention to the switch signal itself. Here's our little switch signal, and there's a cable coming out from the underside of the signal, so that means we're going to drill a hole right here to drop this cable through the layout table. Now, on the other side of the cable, there's a plug that looks like that. This plug's going to go into that control board that we just mounted up a minute ago. So the hole that we drill needs to be big enough to get this plug through, but not bigger than the base of the signal, which is pretty small. In the instructions, Atlas recommends using a 7 16th inch drill bit. Now, as luck would have it, I don't have a 7 16th drill bit on hand, but I do have a 3 8 inch drill bit, which is a little smaller, so I'm going to cheat a little bit and drill the hole with the 3 8 inch drill bit and then wiggle it around a little bit to make the hole a little larger so that we can fit the plug through. But if you've got a 7 16th inch drill bit on hand, go ahead and use that. So here's the drill, and I'm going to position the bit about an inch from the track, because eventually, you know, there'll be ballast on the track and so forth, so you don't want it too close. So about an inch from the track, I'm going to drill my hole. Okay, I've got my hole drilled. Now what I like to do is go along the hole with an X-Acto knife and clean up any of this stuff that's hanging off, just so we get a nice clean mount for the signal. And there we go. Now that we've got our hole, the next step is to drop the cable from the signal through that hole and to feed it under the table, just like this. It's pretty easy. And then once we've got it fed all the way through, the final step will be to secure the signal to the table. I have a fun way that I like to secure these signals to the table. The first thing I do is just secure it in place temporarily with some CA glue. So here I've got some super glue and I'll just put it, you know, around the edges like that and then secure it down and I'll spray it with some fixer to hold it in place just so that it's in place temporarily like that. The next step is the fun part. If you look right here on the signal you'll see there's a little hole and there's another one on the other side 
and I guess you could put a screw through there to secure the signal to the table, but what I like to use is one of these. This is an N-scale track spike, and it's made by a company called Model Power. The part number is number 246, and ordinarily you would use these to secure N-scale or HO-scale track to the table. But these also have lots of nice uses on an O-scale layout, and what I like to use them for is to secure these signals to the table, because these little N-scale spikes are the perfect size to fit through these holes. To install the spike, all I do is load it up in a pair of pliers like this, and then I put it in the hole, and push down gently but firmly and then give it a little tap just like that and then I do the exact same thing on the other side okay we're all done here the next step is to take the other end of that cable coming from the signal and connect it to the control board we're back at the control board and here's the other end of that cable coming from that signal and we'll just plug it into the control board like so, and that's all there is to it. So now the signal is connected to the control board. The next step is to connect the switch to the control board. This is the set of wires that's going to connect the switch to the control board. There are two wires in the set, a black wire and a red wire. On this end, we've got a big modular plug and this is going to attach to the control board. On the other end, we've got the individual wires with these small connectors on them, and these are going to connect up to the terminals on the switch itself. Now because these individual wires are a little easier to pass through the holes in the table than this big plug, we're going to start things off over here at the control board and then we'll drop the wires through the table and finish things up over at the switch. If we take a close look at the control board, on the right hand side you can see that there are two terminals and they're labeled right down here. This one is labeled J2 and this one is labeled J4. The terminal that we're going to use to connect the control board to the switch is J4, which is the outermost terminal. And so what we'll do is we'll take that modular plug that's connected to that wire set that I just showed you and connect it up to the J4 terminal like that. And when you do it, you want to make sure that this little tab that's on one side of the modular plug is facing out, not in, but out. Now that I've got the modular plug connected to the control board, I'm going to take the individual wires on the other end and feed them down under the table so that I can get them over to the switch. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, you would probably have this board mounted underneath the table already, so you wouldn't need to do this actual step. But regardless of where you've got the board mounted, the goal is to get these wires over to the switch. Okay, I've got the two wires from the control board pulled up through the table over by the terminals on the switch. And you'll notice that we've already got three wires connected to these terminals. These wires are going to the Atlas switch controller that we connected up in part one. We're going to leave these where they are. We're not going to touch them. All we're going to do is add these new wires into the mix. The red wire is going to go to the innermost terminal that's closest to the track, which in this case already has a red wire connected to it. And then the black wire, you might think it goes to the center terminal that has a black wire on it. That's not the case. The black wire goes to the outermost terminal, which in this case has the green wire. So the red wire goes to the innermost terminal, the black wire goes to the outermost terminal, and we leave the center terminal alone. Okay, so with the signal and the switch now connected to the control board, the last step to make this thing operational is to bring some power to the control board. So let's go over to our accessory transformer, which in this case is the MTH Z1000, and get some power. Okay, here's our Z1000, and here's the terminal block attached to it. So I'm just going to connect two new wires, and these will go out to our control board. Okay, we're done here. Now we'll take these two new wires over to the control board. We're back at the control board now, and here are those two power wires coming from that Z1000. And we're going to connect them to the control board right here on this terminal block. There are four ports on this terminal block. They're labeled COM, POW, COM, and POW. COM is for common, or black, and POW is for hot, or red. We're going to use the first two ports. So the black wire will go to the first common port, and the red wire will go to the first power port. So I'll stick the black wire in the common port and then tighten it down with a flat blade screwdriver. And then I'll do the same with the power port and the red wire. 
like that. Okay, we've got these two wires connected to the control board. Now I want you to note that there are still two open ports, one comm and one power. Keep these in the back of your mind because they'll come into play in just a few minutes when we hook up the second switch signal. Okay, here's our switch signal, and as you can see, the signal is green. That means that if I'm a train coming down the main line and I see a green signal, the switch up here is thrown in my direction. In this case, it's thrown straight. Now watch what happens when I throw the switch for the siding. Ah, now it goes to red. So again, if I'm a train coming down the main line and I see a red signal, that means that the switch is thrown for the siding and it is not safe to proceed. I need to throw the switch so that I can proceed. So once again, straight, it's safe to proceed. Thrown to the siding, it's not safe to proceed. And I want to emphasize that this is all being done without track power. There is no power to the track right now. The CW80 that powers the track is off right now. This is all being powered by that MTHZ1000. So when I talk about using a separate power source for the switches and signals, that's what I'm talking about. I use the Z1000 to power all the switches and the signals, and that's done independent of track power. So there's no power to the track right now, and yet we have operating signals and operating switches. So let's see it in operation one more time. Straight, safe to proceed. Thrown to the siding, not safe to proceed. Okay, so we've got our switch signal for the main line all set up, but what if you're coming down the siding? You still need to know how this switch up here is thrown before you can proceed. So what we're going to do now is install a second switch signal right about here on the siding. And the installation of that second signal is going to be exactly identical to the first signal with only a few minor differences at the control board. So let's take a look at those minor differences right now. Here's the second control board that I've set up for the new switch signal that's on the siding. And as I said, the setup for the second signal is pretty much identical to the first one with a couple differences. The first difference, and the most important one, has to do with this modular plug and the black and red wires coming off of it. If you recall, on the first board, the black and red wires went off to the switch terminals on the switch. And if we were setting this second board up for a completely different switch, we would do it the same way. But because the second board is related to the same switch as the first board, we do it a little bit differently. Instead of these black and red wires going over to the switch, instead they go over to the first board. And the result is that the second board is slaved off of the first one, so that whatever triggers the first board will also trigger the second. Here are the black and red wires coming from the second board into the first board. They enter the first board on this terminal block that's labeled J5. We put the red wire on the right port and the black wire on the left port. And again, by doing this, what we're doing is setting up the second board as a slave to the first board so that when the switch is thrown, it triggers the first board and the second board at the same time. The other difference in setting up the second board has to do with how the second board gets its power. If you recall, on the first board, these power wires had to go all the way over to the Z1000. Well, on this test track, that's not a big deal because the Z1000 is only about two or three feet away. But on a real layout, you may have 20 or 30 feet to go to get to the transformer. And if you've got five or 10 or 20 of these boards on your layout, that's a whole lot of work to make each control board go all the way back to the transformer to get power. So what Atlas has done is they've made it so you can daisy chain the power connections on these control boards. So if you remember, I said there were two open power ports on this first board. That's what those open ports are for. So on the second board, instead of it getting its power from the Z1000 directly, it's only coming over about six inches and it's getting its power from these two open ports on the first board. And then on the second board, it's also got two open ports. So these would go out to a third board if I had one and a fourth and a fifth and so on and so on. It should be noted that the daisy chaining of the power connections on these boards can be done regardless of what each board is actually doing. It has no effect on the functionality of each board. It's just an easier way to get power to each subsequent board on your layout. So I could have 10 different boards connected to 10 different switches controlling 10 different signals, and yet I could still daisy chain all of those power connections together. Okay, we've got the second switch signal installed now, so let's take a look at what we've got. And to make it easier to see the lights on the signals, I've dimmed the lights a little bit. We've got our two signals here. This one's for the main line. This one's for the siding. And as you can see, they're lit opposite of each other. When one is green, the other one's going to be red. 
So right now, the main line has a green signal because the switch is thrown straight, which means that if you're on the main line, it's safe to proceed through the switch. Whereas if you're on the siding, the switch is not thrown for the siding right now, so it's not safe to proceed. If I throw the switch for the siding, watch what happens. Now they switch. So now for the main line, you've got a red light, which means it's not safe to proceed. But for the siding, because the switch is now thrown for the siding, you've got a green light. So once again, here's straight for the main line, and then here's diverting for the siding. Pretty cool. Okay, so now that we've got these two switch signals successfully installed, we're going to install one final switch signal way down here on the other end of the switch, so that if a train is coming from this direction, it can also tell how the switch is thrown. Here's the control board for the third and final switch signal. Its configuration is identical to the second board, so the power feeds from the third board are going over to the open ports on the second board, just like the power feeds on the second board went over to the open ports on the first board. And then these black and red wires over here are going into the second board, so that the third board is now slaved up to the second board, and the second board is slaved up to the first board. So hopefully you can see that there's a pattern evolving here. We're just chaining these boards together so that when the switch is thrown, all three boards get triggered at once. Here's the third and final switch signal, and its operation is pretty simple. If I'm a train coming in this direction, green means that the switch is thrown straight. Red means that the switch is thrown diverting. So right now it's green, which means the switch is thrown straight. If I throw it for the siding, watch what happens. It turns red. And then back straight again, goes back to green. So now we have all three of these signals working together to indicate how this switch is thrown. Now, I know you can't see the color of these signals down here, but let me give you an overall description of how the whole system works. This signal here and this signal down here on the main line will always be the same color. They're either both green or both red. The signal on the siding is always going to be the reverse of what these two signals are. So right now, we've got a green signal here and a green signal down here. That means that this is green because the switch is thrown straight and this one is green because the switch is thrown straight and thrown in the direction of the main line. At the same time, the signal over on the siding is red, because if I'm coming down the siding, the switch is not thrown in my direction right now. Now I'll throw the switch for the siding, and let's watch what happens. Okay, now this one is red. This one down here is also red, because no matter which way you're coming from on the main line, the switch is not thrown in the direction of the main line. If you're coming down this way, it's thrown for the siding, and if you're coming this way, it's also thrown for the siding, and it's not thrown in your direction. So both of these signals are red. But the signal on the siding is now green, because if I'm coming down the siding, the switch is diverting, it's thrown in my direction, and it's safe to proceed through the switch. Okay, so the installation of all of the switch signals is now complete, but before we move on, I want to go over a few closing thoughts about the switch signals. First of all, I realize that this setup for the switch signals is probably not the most prototypical thing in the world. The real railroads probably wouldn't do it like this, but the reason I do it like this on my layout goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of this video. I like to balance prototypical with practical, so while this may not be the most prototypical setup, it can be very practical for a model railroad. For the operator of a model railroad, it can be very practical and very helpful to be able to look at one of these signals and tell how the switch is thrown, particularly when the switch is not easy to see. It may be a switch that's buried back deep in the layout, or it may be a switch that's hidden in a tunnel or something like that. And if you put one of these switch signals in a visible location, you can then tell how that switch is thrown without actually seeing the switch itself. Now, some people will tell you that the way to determine how the switches on your layout are thrown is to build a big control panel and then have a map of the track on the control panel and then use LEDs to indicate how each switch is thrown. And you can do it that way, but my take on it is that with all the wireless control available for the trains today, I don't like to be chained down to the control panel. I like to follow the train through the layout, especially since my layout goes through four different rooms in my basement. I like to follow the train as it goes through each room. And these signals help me do that. I can go through each room and then just look at the signals and I know at a glance how the switches are thrown without having to go all the way back to a control panel. 
The next thing I want to bring up is that I do not want you to have the impression that for every switch on your layout, you have to have three of these signals. This is a demo board, and so I hooked up all three signals just to show you what's possible. But on an actual layout, you may or may not need all three of these signals. You may need one or two or maybe three or none at all. It just depends on your situation. So don't think of this as a rule book for how to hook up these signals. Think of this as me showing you what's possible. And then what I want you to do is take that knowledge and customize it to your particular needs on your layout. My final closing thought on these switch signals has to do with the proximity of the signals to the switch. Now, because this is a demo board, I've got all of these signals relatively close to the switch, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can put these signals anywhere you want. I could put this signal 20 feet away from the switch if I wanted to. Now, obviously, if I did that, I'd have to do some surgery on the cables to make them longer, but the point is you can put these signals anywhere you want. So to close out this section of the video, I'm going to show you an example of this on my layout where I've got one of these signals installed and it's nowhere near the switch that it represents. Let's go ahead and take a look. Here we are on the layout, and as you can see, I've got a switch signal installed right here next to the track. This track goes back into that tunnel, and about five or six feet back into the tunnel, there's a hidden switch, because in order to get my track plan on my layout to work the way I wanted it to work, I had to have a switch hidden in the tunnel. So there's no way for me to see how that switch is thrown just by looking at it, because the switch is concealed inside the tunnel. So in order to tell how that switch is thrown, I've got this switch signal out here. So even though the switch is five or six feet away back in the tunnel, I've got the switch signal out here where I can see it. And as you can see, the light is red now, which means the switch is not thrown in the direction of this track. If I throw it the other way, it'll go green. And that means that it's now safe to proceed into the tunnel because the switch is thrown in the correct direction. Okay, here we have the block signals that we're going to install today on our test track. But before we get into that, for those of you who are new to this, let me take a minute and explain what block signals are all about. Okay, so what are block signals all about? Well, block signals can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and they can come in all sorts of different configurations, and they can get kind of complicated sometimes. But at the heart of it all, block signals are put in place to avoid accidents on the railroads. Because if you have more than one train operating on the same stretch of track, you need to have a system in place to prevent those trains from running into each other. And that's exactly what block signals are all about. Now, to help you understand how block signals help keep trains from running into each other, let's take a look at the demo board here. And keep in mind, again, this is just a demo board. It's pretty compact. And so all of the signals that we installed today are going to be pretty close to each other. It wouldn't be like that on a real layout or on the real railroad. So just use your imagination. On a real railroad, this might be 5 or 10 miles long. On your own layout, this might be 5 or 10 feet long. But anyway, what we're going to do is divide this main line up into several sections, which are called blocks. Now, the size of each block really doesn't matter. That's up to you. There is no rule about how long each block is. On a real railroad, a block can be a few miles long. On a model layout, it might be a few feet, might be a few yards. It's really up to you. But on our test track here, what we'll do is we'll make three blocks. The first block will be from right before the switch up until right after the switch. So I'll put a line right here and then another line right here. And we'll label this block one. Then the second block will be from here all the way up until just before this second switch back here. This will be block two. And then block three will be everything back here. So block three is right here. Then what we're going to do is install a signal in front of each block. So signal one will go right here. Then we'll put another signal right here before block two. And then finally, a third signal back here before block three. And so what it really comes down to in the end is a block is the distance between two signals. So signal here, signal here, this is a block. Signal here, signal back here, this is a block and then signal here, and then wherever the next signal would be, would be block three. The next step is to put some trains on the track. I'm going to represent the trains with these little track mobiles because they're small and compact, and they won't take up much room on the limited real estate that we have on this demo track. So I'm going to put one train here in block one, and then another train over here in block two. 
And these could be passenger trains or freight trains, it doesn't matter. So if this train in block one is coming down the main line this way, he needs to know that there's a train ahead of him so that he doesn't hit the train. That's what block signals are for. We would put a signal here and that signal would indicate to this train, hey, there's a train ahead of you. You need to slow down or stop or do whatever the required action is to avoid hitting that train. And it would work the same way if we had a train down here in block three. If this train was coming down, this signal here would indicate to this train, hey, there's another train in block three. You need to slow down or stop or do whatever action is necessary to avoid hitting that train. So that's what block signals are all about, and that's what we're about to set up. We're going to start by setting up a single block signal right here, and then we'll finish off by installing two more, one here and one here, and then we will interconnect them with the Atlas signal system so that they work as a unified system that will follow the train wherever it may go on your layout. Okay, once again, here are the block signals that we're going to be using today. This is a searchlight signal here, and then back here we've got a four pack of the Type G signals. We're going to work with the Type G signals first, so let's go ahead and take one out of the box and have a look at the equipment. The most important item in the box, of course, is the set of instructions. Make sure you read the instructions from beginning to end before you start any work. This is the equipment that will come with each Type G signal, so let's go ahead and take a closer look at each item. Up first we've got the signal itself. This is a very nicely detailed signal and being a type G signal means that it has this triangle light format. So you've got three lights for three different aspects, green, yellow, or red. And then down here you've got the cable that's going to go over to the control board. I'll show you that in just a second. And then right here you've got an optional number plate and the number plate can be removed if you don't want it on there. The absence or presence of the number plate determines whether the signal is an absolute signal or an intermediate signal, but we'll get more into that later on. Up next, we've got the control board, or should I say the control shed. Each signal comes with this nice attractive shed that you can leave up on the layout and it looks really nice. And inside the shed is the control board. On the underside here, we've got the plugs that the signals will go into, as well as the terminals for the power connections and so forth. And then if you open up the top of the shed, you can see the top of the board. And it's all packaged nicely in this little shed. And it looks really nice if you just put it next to the track. You get a nice realistic looking utility shed along with your signals. Now in the event that you don't want to use the shed, you don't have to. You can remove the control board from the shed by removing these feet on the bottom of the shed and then popping the control board out. If you do that, then you can use these optional mounting brackets that also come with the signal to mount the board anywhere you want. These are exactly the same as the mounting brackets that came with the switch signals and you would use them in exactly the same way. Okay, so now that you've seen all of the equipment, let's go ahead and get started. The first step will be to mount up the signal. Okay, as I said, the first signal is going to be installed in front of block two. This is block number two here and here's that signal mark that I made. So let's go ahead and drill our hole to drop the cable through for the signal. The instructions call for a half inch bit, so that's what we're going to use. And I'll drill the hole about an inch or so away from the track. The hole is drilled and cleaned up, so now let's drop the cable for the signal through. It's got this modular plug on it, so you need to be careful when you put that through. And we'll just feed it under the table like that. Okay, there we go. The next step is to secure the signal in place and we're going to use the exact same method to secure it in place that we did with the switch signals. We're going to use a little bit of super glue and then those end scale track spikes. We've got our signal in place, so the next thing we're going to do is take the cable from the signal and get it over to the control board. And in the case of this signal, I'm going to actually use the decorative shed that came with the signal that has the control board up inside. You can put the shed anywhere you want, but I'm going to put mine right about here. So that means that we're going to need to drill a hole in the table right here to bring the wires up to the control board. Now the instructions recommend using a 5 8 inch bit, but I'm actually going to use something a little larger because we're going to have quite a few wires coming up into the shed, so I want to make sure I have enough room. So in this case, for the shed, I'm going to use a one inch spade bit.
Okay, I've drilled my one inch hole and I've pulled the cable from the signal up through the hole. So the next step is to connect this cable to the control board that's inside the shed. If you look at the control board, there are three modular plugs and they're labeled J1, J2, and J3. The signal itself is going to go into the J3 plug. So I will take the cable and stick it into the J3 plug like that. And then we'll just put the shed down like that. So now we've connected the signal to the control board. The next step is to bring some power to the control board. We're going to supply the power for that control board in the same way we supplied power for the switch signals. Here's the MTHZ1000 that's powering all of our signals. Here's the terminal block and I've connected two new wires, black and red. Here they are, so we'll run them under the table and then pull them up through that hole and connect them to the control board. We're back by that big hole we drilled, and here's the other end of those two wires that we connected to the terminal block. So the next step is to connect these power wires to the control board. If we take a look at the control board, this block here is responsible for the power connections. And this should look pretty familiar to you because it's almost identical to what's on those switch signal control boards that we already hooked up. And just like on those boards, we've got four power ports. We've got a comm, a power, and then another comm and power down here. So those two wires that we just brought over from the transformer are going to connect to these first two ports. The black will go to the comm and the red will go to the power. And then these two additional ports down here are used for daisy chaining. Now, as a side note, even though right now I'm getting the power for this board directly from the transformer, it doesn't have to be that way. I could get this power by daisy chaining off of those switch signal control boards that we already hooked up. It really doesn't matter where you get the power for this board. You can get it from the transformer or just by daisy chaining off of some other Atlas control board. I've powered up the transformer, and as you can see, this red LED on the control board is now on. That's good. That means the connection is correct and the board has power. So now let's go check out what the signal is doing. Okay, here's our signal, and as you can see, we're getting somewhere now because we've got a green aspect on the signal. That's good. That means the signal has power, but we're not done yet because right now the signal has no way of knowing whether or not there's a train on this block. I'll show you what I mean. If I put a train on the block like this, nothing happens. The signal stays green. What should be happening is that with a train now on the block, it should go to red. But again, it's not because it doesn't have any way of knowing that the train's there. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to set up a triggering mechanism so that when a train does enter the block, the signal goes to red. And then when the train leaves the block, it goes back to green. Now, there are many methods you can use to trigger the signal. But the easiest method, and the one that we're going to use for this first signal, uses what's called an insulated rail. Okay, so for those of you who have been in the hobby for a while, you probably already know what an insulated rail is all about. But for those of you who are new to this, I'll explain as we go along. Now, with three rail track, the way it typically works is that the center rail is hot, and the two outer rails are the common. So to create an isolated rail, what we're going to do is take a section of one of these outer rails, and in my case, I'm going to use this one, and we're going to electrically isolate an entire section of this outer rail by severing the electrical connection at either end of that section of rail. So we'll sever it down here, and then we'll sever it down here, thus creating an entire section of insulated rail that is electrically isolated from the rest of the track. Now, if you're new at this, you may be wondering what an isolated rail has anything to do with triggering this signal, but trust me, it'll all make sense when we're done. The first thing we want to do is electrically isolate this rail by severing the connection here and at the other end. Now, there are two ways you can do that. The first way is to use an insulated track clip, and the second way is to physically cut the track. I'll show you both of those methods. If when you're planning your layout, you know where you're going to put your signals before you lay your track, you can create isolated track sections by using these plastic insulating clips. These are made by Atlas, and I showed you these in part one of this tutorial, and they just take the place of these metal clips. And because they're plastic, they're non-conductive, so any current that's in this rail will not be carried over to our isolated rail. Now, on the other hand, if you're like me, and you're not the best at planning in advance, and you've already got your track installed on your layout, or if you've got an established layout and you just want to add more signals, you may find yourself in a situation where it's difficult, if not impossible, to start pulling the track apart and swapping out metal clips for plastic clips. In that situation, what you want to do 
is physically cut the rail. So that's what we're going to do right here. And to cut the rail, we're going to use the cutoff wheel on a Dremel tool. Here's my Dremel tool, and this particular model is the cordless Dremel 8200, and then I've also got the right angle attachment, but any Dremel tool will do. And for those of you who are new to the hobby, if you do not yet have a Dremel tool in your arsenal, run out to Home Depot or Lowe's immediately and pick one up because they are invaluable for this hobby. There's so much you can do with these things. I can't imagine what I would do without mine. And they're very affordable. You can generally get a kit that will include the tool as well as a selection of attachments for under $100, so they're very affordable. And hey, since I'm making this video around the holidays, they make a great Christmas gift. Anyway, the attachment that we're gonna use today is the fiber metal cutoff wheel. So let's go ahead and cut our track. Okay, I'm gonna make my cut right about here between these two ties. You don't wanna make the cut over a tie. You wanna make it in between ties. So I'm gonna put it right here. And I'm gonna do one nice smooth motion when I make the cut. I'm not gonna go up and down and make an uneven cut. Just one smooth motion. And then once I get all the way through, I'll move the Dremel tool back and forth a little bit to deburr the edges as well as widen the gap a little bit. I want the gap to be about 1 16th of an inch. So let's go ahead and cut. Here's our completed cut. It's pretty smooth and there are no nasty edges and it's about a sixteenth of an inch wide just like I wanted. The last thing that I like to do after I make a cut like this is to take a vacuum cleaner and suck up any of the metal filings that were thrown off when we made the cut because you don't want those metal filings getting into the track or the trains later on. Okay, so now on this outer rail from the point where we made the cut with the Dremel tool all the way back to where we install that insulating pin is one giant insulated rail. In other words, it is electrically isolated from the rest of the track. So now we're going to use this insulated rail to trigger the signal. Let me show you how that's going to work. I've drawn up a little diagram to help explain how this is going to work. Over here we've got our track. This is the center rail, this is one outer rail, and here's the other outer rail. On this outer rail, I've got our insulated rail right here. So this gap here would be where we made the cut with the Dremel tool, and this gap here would be the insulating pin that we installed. And then there's our insulated rail. Right here we've got the signal and the control board, and then we've got our two power supplies. We've got track power, which in this case is the Lionel CW80, and then we've got accessory power, which in this case is the MTHZ1000. Now, this diagram of the control board is very simplified, but essentially, in order for the signal to change when a train is present on the block, it needs to get a hot in common. Now the hot for this signal is going to be coming from our accessory power, which is the MTH Z1000. But the common, instead of the common coming from the Z1000, what we're gonna do is connect that common to our insulated rail. But wait a minute, because this is an insulated rail that is electrically isolated from the rest of the track, in its default state, there is no common on this insulated rail to be provided to the signal. Therefore, the signal remains unchanged. Now, this is where the train comes into play. If we look at the other two rails, the center rail is connected to the hot terminal on the CW80, and the other outer rail is connected to the common on the CW80. When a train enters the block, because the train has wheels and axles that are made of metal, the metal wheels and axles take the common on this other outer rail and jump it across to the insulated rail, thereby providing common to the insulated rail, providing common to the signal, and triggering the signal. And then when the train leaves the block, this connection is broken, there is no longer any common on the insulated rail, and the signal goes back to its default setting. Now, I should point out that in a setup like this where you've got two power supplies, one for the track and one for the signals, what makes this all possible is this. This is that bridge connection that we made at the very beginning of this video when we connected the two grounds on the two transformers. Without this, none of this will work. So that's how the insulated rail method works. This is nothing new. Your dad and granddad were using the same method when they were kids. It's a very dependable and easy way to have the train trigger signals and trackside accessories. Anyway, with all this in mind, our next step is right here. We're gonna take a wire and connect one end of it to the insulated rail and then connect the other end to the control board. Okay, we're back at our insulated rail, and typically the easiest way to connect a wire to the insulated rail is to just solder the wire directly onto the rail. So that's what I've done here. 
I've got my solder connection here and the wire is then dropping down through a hole which will take the wire over to the control board. Now a few tips about making this solder connection. First of all, Atlas has plastic ties on their track. So when you make the solder connection, be sure not to get the rail too hot because if you do, it could start to melt the ties. Secondly, I like to make the solder connection on the inside of the rail rather than the outside. That way when people see your layout, they don't see a bunch of wires on the outside of the track. And then finally, when you do make the solder connection on the inside of the track, make sure it's low enough so that the flanges on the wheels of the trucks of the trains do not hit the solder joint. Anyway, let's go ahead and follow this wire down through the hole and over to the control board. Here's the other end of that wire and I've stripped back about an eighth of an inch and we're gonna put the wire into this input right here, which is labeled DIN for detector input. Okay, so that does it. The connections for the signal are now complete, so let's go ahead and power up the system and see what we've got. Okay, we've got power to the signal, and since there is no train on the number two block right now, we've got our default green aspect, which indicates clear. Now let's put a train on the block, and I'm gonna do this step by step so that you understand exactly how this works. I'm gonna simulate a train with this set of alligator clips. I'm going to put one clip on the rail that has the common on it, and then the other clip will go onto our insulated rail, and this will take the common from this rail and bridge it over to the insulated rail, and watch what happens. We get a red aspect, which means stop. And then when the train leaves the block, so to speak, if I take it off, it'll go to a yellow aspect or approach, and then in a few seconds, it'll go back to green or clear. Next, instead of using the alligator clips, I'm going to use this wheel set that I got off of a freight car. And because the wheels and the axle are made of metal, it should function exactly like the alligator clips. Let's give it a try. Okay, once again, we get the red aspect, which means stop. And then if the train leaves the block, it'll go to a yellow aspect, which means approach. And then back to green or clear. And now let's try the real thing. Here's my train, and I'll put it on the block. And as you can see, we get the red aspect. And then when the train leaves the block, it'll go to approach. And then after a few seconds, it'll go back to clear. And finally, just to give you the big picture, let's take a look at how this would work on a layout. For the train, I'm gonna use this little freight car because it's easy to push by hand. Right now, it's in block one, so the signal for block two indicates clear because there is no train in block two. But as soon as the car moves into block two, as soon as it gets onto that insulated rail, the signal goes to a red aspect, which means stop. And it'll stay that way until this train leaves block two. So if I'm another train coming up behind this one and I see the red aspect, I know that there's a train ahead and I need to stop or take whatever action is necessary to prevent a collision. And then as soon as this train leaves block two and goes into block three, look what happens. It goes to an approach indication, and then after a few seconds, it'll go back to clear or green. Pretty cool. So that takes care of the installation of our first signal. And I want to point out before we move on that just like with the switch signals in the beginning of this video, what you just saw with the signal being triggered by the insulated rail happened independent of track power. The CW80 that powers the track was turned off for that demonstration. You might think that the CW80 needed to be on since we were bridging from common over here to our insulated rail, but that's not the case. And it has to do with that ground bridge that we made at the beginning of this video. Because of that, ground on the CW80 that powers the track equals ground on the MTHZ1000 that powers the signals and the switches. And because of that, this works even if the transformer powering the track is turned off. Anyway, the next step is to install two more of these signals. We're going to install one right here in front of block number one, and then we'll install another one down here in front of block number three. The installation of those two additional signals is going to be identical to the first signal, except that I'm going to make a couple optional variations in the installation, which I'll show you right now. Here's the signal that I installed for block number one, and as I said, the installation is identical to the first signal that we installed, but there are a few minor differences that I want to point out. 
Obviously, the biggest difference is that I'm using a different type of signal for block one than I used for block two. And I didn't do this for any sort of prototypical reason. I just did it to show you a little bit of variety. This is a searchlight type signal as opposed to the type G signal that I used back here. But the installation and the functionality of the searchlight signal is the same as the type G signal. The only difference is that on the type G signal, we've got three different lenses for the three different aspects, red, yellow, and green. And on the searchlight signal, we've got a single lens with all three aspects in that one lens. So if I roll this test car down the track, you'll see that when I enter the block, it turns red. And then when I leave that block for block two, it'll go to an approach indication and then eventually back to clear. Another difference is that block number one contains a switch, so that makes creating an insulated rail a little more complicated because you can't create an insulated rail through a switch. It won't work like that. What you end up having to do is create an insulated rail before and after the switch, so it makes wiring up that insulated rail just a little more complicated than usual, but fortunately the instructions that come with each signal do a good job of explaining how to do the wiring, so if you find yourself in that situation where you have a switch going through your block, just refer to the instructions. And the final difference is that unlike the first signal that we installed, with this signal I decided to take the control board out of that nice looking utility shed and just mount it right on the table just to show you what it looks like when it's out of the utility shed. And of course, just like with the switch signals that we installed earlier, normally you wouldn't mount it up on the table like this, you would put it under the table and out of sight. Oh, and by the way, the power coming into this new control board is not coming directly from the MTHZ1000 like it was with the first block signal that we installed. Instead, I had another Atlas control board right next door, that being the control board for the third and final switch signal that we installed earlier. So I just daisy chained off of that control board to the new one. And then I've also daisy chained out of this one to go to the third and final block signal that I've installed, which I'll show you right now. Here's the third and final block signal that I've installed for block number three. And the big difference here is that instead of using an insulated rail to trigger the signal, I've used a trackside infrared detector. Here's a look at the infrared detector. This particular model is made by MTH, although Lionel also makes one of their own. And I'm sure there are other various companies out there that make them as well. Its operation is pretty simple. It's basically a motion detector. It sends out a beam of infrared light, and then when a train or anything else interrupts the beam, it triggers the detector, which then activates whatever you have hooked up to the detector, which in this case is the signal. And then when the train passes and the beam is no longer being interrupted, it shuts off and the signal goes back to an approach indication and then finally back to its default clear indication. Here's a look at the back of the infrared detector and the wiring needed to make this work is actually pretty simple because the control board for the signal is what's doing most of the work. The infrared device is just the trigger and so for that reason, even though there are five terminals on the back of the infrared device, we're only going to be using three of them. On the right hand side are the black and red wires that supply power to the infrared device itself and I've daisy chained these off of the control board for the signal. Here's the common and here's the hot. The only other wire is right here. This black wire is coming from the control board and in the other two signals this was the black wire that we soldered onto the insulated rail. But in this case, instead of being soldered to the insulated rail, it's connected to this last terminal, which is labeled NO, which stands for normally open. And that's all there is to it. Okay, so for the three signals that we've installed, you've now seen two methods for triggering the signal. You've got the insulated rail method that we used for block one and block two, and then you've got the infrared device method that we used for block three. Now, some of you may be wondering which method for triggering the signal should you use on your layout and which method is better. Well, when it comes to your layout, feel free to use both methods. You don't have to use just one or the other. And then in terms of which method is better, neither one is really better than the other. They're just different and each method comes with its own set of pros and cons. When it comes to using the insulated rail method, the factors that it has going for it are that it's very easy to implement and it's also very cheap. You don't have to buy any additional equipment. And it's also very prototypical because if you make your insulated rail the length of your block, that means that the signal will be triggered no matter if the train is at the beginning of the block, in the middle, or at the end. If that train is in the block, the signal gets triggered and the signal does not get deactivated until the entire train has left the block. 
The downside of using the insulated rail method is that it does require making that cut to the rail, which is a permanent modification. So if you're not comfortable with that, or if you've got a temporary layout and making permanent modifications to the track is not in your best interest, you may want to go with the infrared device method instead. When it comes to using the infrared device method, the factors that it has going for it are that the setup is very easy and it's not permanent. It doesn't require making any modifications to the track itself. So if at some point in time you want to change your track plan or move your signals, you can do that without having any scars on your track or without having to replace any of your track. The infrared detector method does have a couple downsides, however, the first of which is that it's more expensive than the insulated rail method because, of course, you have to purchase the infrared detector, and they run about $40 or so. Secondly, the infrared detector method is not nearly as prototypical as the insulated rail method, and that has to do with how the infrared detector works. The detector is only capable of activating the signal when there's a train directly in front of the detector. If you have a block that's 5 or 10 feet long, there is no way for the detector to know what's on the entire block at all times. It only knows what's directly in front of it. And so for that reason, on a long block, you could have the train still be on part of the block and yet not in front of the signal, and you would get a false clear indication even though there's still a train on the block. Okay, so now we've got all three signals installed, and they're all working correctly, but we're not done quite yet because right now each signal is working as an individual signal. The signals are not working together. In other words, this signal is not aware of what this signal is doing, and this signal is not aware of what this signal is doing. To illustrate this, let's roll a car down the track and see what happens. For this demonstration, I've switched back to the little ore car because it'll be a little easier for me to reach when I get way down there. But let's watch what happens when we roll it down the track. When I get into block one, as expected, the signal goes to a red or stop indication. Now, when I go into block two, let's see what happens. Now, block two goes to a stop indication. Block one will temporarily go to a yellow or approach indication. And then in a few seconds, it'll go back to a green or clear indication. And the reason it's doing that is because this signal is acting by itself. It has no idea what's happening further on down the line. What would be more realistic, what would be more prototypical, is for this signal to remain in a yellow approach indication while there's still a train in block two. And the reason for that is that if there's a train coming this direction, you don't want that train to suddenly have to stop immediately. You want the train to have some warning. That's what the yellow approach indication is for. When the train comes down, when he gets to block one, he sees yellow, which means, hey, slow down and be prepared to stop at the next signal. But again, it can't do that right now because the signal is acting by itself. The same thing happens if we go from block two to block three. If I move our car down into block three, now we get a red stop indication here, and then down here we get the temporary approach, and then eventually it'll go back to clear, instead of staying in approach until this train leaves block three. And again, it's all because these signals are acting as individual signals instead of talking to each other and acting as a cohesive system. Connecting one signal to another is very easy. This is all you need. This is a signal cable that's made by Atlas. It's sold separately. It doesn't come with the signal, but it's basically a patch cable. It connects one control board to another, and that allows the signals to talk to each other. Now, they come in various sizes. This is the 7-foot length but you can also get a 15 foot length and a 25 foot length. We're gonna be connecting three signals together today, which means we'll need two of these cables. So let's go ahead and get started. When these signals are connected together, the flow of information goes in the direction opposite of the way the signals are facing. And so instead of signal one talking to signal two, and then signal two talking to signal three, it goes in reverse order. Signal three will talk to signal two, and then signal two will talk to signal one. So what we're gonna do with those signal cables is start back here in block three and then work our way forward. Okay, so here's the control board for the signal in block number three, and here's one of those signal cables that I've already pulled up through the hole in the table. If we look at the control board for the signal, you'll see that there are two open ports here. This one is labeled J1 and the other is labeled J2. And these two ports allow the control boards for the signals to talk to each other. The easiest way to think about this is that the J1 port is the input side and the J2 port is the output side. 
On the input side, this would be the input from the next signal down the line, which in this case would be signal number four. But of course, on this demo board, we don't have a fourth signal, so the input side for this signal number three will be unused. Now on the output side, this will go out to the previous signal, which is the signal on block two. So what we're gonna do is plug the signal cable into the J2 port, like that, and now we'll follow this cable over to the control board for the signal that's on block number two. Here's the control board for the signal on block number two, and here's the other end of that cable coming from the signal on block number three. And because it's coming from that signal into this signal, we're going to connect it to the input side, which of course is the J1 port. So we'll just plug it into the J1 port, like that. The next step is to just keep going. We're gonna add another link to the chain. We're gonna go out from this board, which is for the signal on block two, and into the control board for the signal on block one. So here's a second signal cable that I've pulled up through the table, and I'm gonna put this into the J2 output side, like that. And now let's go find the other end of this cable at the control board for the signal on block one. Here's the other end of that cable, and here's the control board for the signal that's on block number one. And again, because this cable is coming from the signal on block two, we're going to put it on the input side, which is the J1 port. So we'll just plug it in, like that. On the J2 output side, we're not gonna go any further because this demo board only has three signals. So there isn't another signal to go to, but if there was another signal prior to the block one signal, we would go out from here and then to that signal and then to the next signal and the next signal and so on and so on until all of the signals were connected together. And in fact, if we had a big loop of track, eventually we would come full circle back around to where we started at that signal on block three. Okay, so now that we've got all three signals connected to each other and they're all talking to each other, let's roll our test car down the track again and see what happens this time. And to make it a little easier to see the signals, I've dimmed the lights a little bit. Okay, when we move our train into block one, as expected, we get the red stop indication, just like we did last time, so nothing has changed here. Now let's watch what happens when we move into block two. And if you recall, the last time we moved into block two, we got the red stop indication on the signal in block two, but for the signal in block one, it only temporarily went to a yellow approach indication, and then eventually it went back to the green clear indication. So let's see what happens this time. Okay, in block two now, we get the red stop indication, but on block one, it now stays at the yellow approach indication, and it will not go back to green or clear until this train leaves block two. And the reason for that is because the signals are now connected to each other and talking to each other. And this signal is saying, hey, signal one, don't go back to green yet because I've still got a train up here, and I need you to stay at approach until this train leaves my block. And the reason for that is that if there's a second train coming up behind our first train, you don't want that train to have to slam on his brakes the second he sees a red stop indication. You want to give that train some advanced warning of the train that's ahead of him, and that's what the yellow approach indication is for. So now, when a train is coming up behind this train, it sees the yellow approach indication which says, hey, there's a train ahead of you, slow down, and be prepared to stop at the next signal. And that's a much more prototypical way for these signals to operate. Now, when the train moves down into block three, what should happen is that this yellow approach and red stop combination should shift down with the train. So let's go ahead and move the train into block three and see what happens. Okay, block three is now occupied, so we get the red stop indication down there. Block two, because it is now immediately behind the occupied block, goes to the yellow approach indication, and block one, because block two is now empty, can go back to the green clear indication. So from the second train's perspective, if I'm that second train coming down the track towards the first train, what's gonna happen is that when I get into block one, I see the green clear indication, so I just keep on going, it's all smooth sailing. When I get to block two, I see the yellow approach indication. That tells me, hey, I need to slow down and be prepared to stop before the next signal because there's a train in that next block. So hopefully at this point, you can see that there's a pattern emerging here. If you use the Atlas signal system like this, you're always going to have a combination of yellow and red following your train across the entire layout so that no matter where the train is, the occupied block always has the red stop indication and the block immediately behind the occupied block always has the yellow approach indication. 
Now, I'm not going to show this here, but if you wanted to take it one step further, you could have bi-directional signaling on your track so that you have signals facing both directions. In that case, not only would you have the yellow approach and red stop indications behind the train, but you would have on the opposite side of the track a yellow approach and red stop indication in front of the train so that no matter what direction that second train was coming from, it would always have advanced notification of that first train. Okay, so that takes care of the operation of the signals. The last thing I want to talk about today before we wrap it up is something that I said I'd get back to earlier, and that is the function of the number plates on the signals. On the actual railroads, the absence or presence of a number plate on a signal is typically used to determine whether the signal is an absolute signal or an automatic signal. An absolute signal is a signal that is controlled by a human train dispatcher, whereas an automatic signal is, as its name implies, automatic. It's activated by the train's position on the track and there is no human interaction. An absolute signal typically has no number board on it, whereas an automatic signal does have a number board with a series of numbers on it. If you want your signal to have the appearance of an automatic signal, Atlas packages a set of stick-on numbers that you can apply to the number plates for each signal. And then if you want a signal to have the appearance of an absolute signal, you can just remove the number plate altogether. Now, of course, on a model train layout, most of us are not going to have a dedicated train dispatcher to control the absolute signals, but by removing the number plate, you can at least give the illusion of having absolute signals on your layout. Now, if this is something that you're interested in, what I would recommend is getting on the internet and doing some research into absolute and automatic signals, and then you can take that knowledge and apply it on your layout where appropriate. I've got a couple closing thoughts that I want to share with you. The first one is that I want to reiterate what I've already said a couple times in this video, and that is that I don't want you to take this signal tutorial as a rule book for how to do signals. Signaling is a pretty complex subject, and there's a lot to it that we haven't covered here. I've gone over some of the basics, but what I really want you to take from this video is the technical knowledge of how to hook up the Atlas signal system, but then it's up to you to do the necessary research to find out the specific types of signals and the positions of those signals that are appropriate for your layout. My second closing thought is that while I've shown you the basic operation of these Atlas signals, there are some advanced functions that I haven't shown you. These advanced functions are typically used by more advanced modelers, and because this tutorial is geared more towards beginners, I chose not to include those advanced functions in this video. But if you're interested in those advanced functions, read the instructions that come with each signal because they do a great job of explaining how to make those tweaks. My final closing thought has to do with buying the signals. Atlas makes a good number of signals themselves, like the ones you've seen here today. But if you find yourself in a situation where you need a type of signal that is not made by Atlas, or you need some sort of custom solution, there's a company out there called Custom Signals, and they make just about any kind of signal you can imagine, and all of their signals are compatible with the Atlas signal system. Okay, that about wraps it up for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time.